Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken. Uh, I work at Astra. Astra is a launch services provider. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about our, uh, one of our use cases for Argo and how we use it uh, to orchestrate some of our launch test and simulation infrastructure. Um, quick show of hands for folks that are using Argo today. Okay, so that's pretty much everybody, almost everybody. Uh, folks that are using Hera today. Nobody? Okay, wow, cool. Um, okay, so before we kind of talk about Argo, uh, first we need to talk about how do you even test rocket software, uh, which is something that I've been learning over the past year. <laughs> um, so in order to test software that runs on a rocket, uh, there's quite a few challenges. You've got, you know, multiple embedded systems. Um, you know, they're not, you know, we're not using Raspberry Pis or like off-the-shelf reference boards. It's typically custom hardware. You've got a lot of I/O interfaces um, and control loops that uh, are actually, you know, talking to or meant to talk to physical things and then receive data from physical things like sensors and um, real-time systems. And a high, you know, it's a high burden to actually operate the real thing. Um, you know, you want to you want to be able to ensure that your software is functioning correctly before you actually plug it into the physical thing because you could break the physical thing uh, if it's not. Um, and so that kind of leads us into uh, hardware in the loop, uh, commonly referred to as Hill. And so this is a test methodology for uh, embedded control systems um, where basically you take the control system that's under test uh, and then you, uh, instead of hooking it up to the real physical things that it's going to control, you actually hook it up to simulated models. Um, so then it's able to send control signals, get, uh, get feedback from the models. Uh, and as far as it knows, it's talking to the real thing, but actually it's not. Uh, so what does that look like? Um, at a high level, uh, if you look at the picture here, you can see we've got up in the green box, we kind of call the device under test or the, the control system that we're testing. Um, and then typically the, the inputs and outputs are physical wires going into um, simulator or, or simulators. Um, and then uh, what that simulator often looks like in a nutshell is that you have some kind of specific hardware platform, uh, sometimes referred to as a DAC or data acquisition hardware that basically takes all of the wires coming out of the device under test and all the electrical signals and then converts that um, through some software into data that the models can consume. Uh, and then the models basically kind of do a similar thing on the way out um, where they basically talk to the data acquisition hardware and then that gets turned into electrical signals which then go back into the um, device under test inputs. And so uh, that's basically how you do it in a nutshell, um, but it does get a little bit more complicated in our case because um, we have some other things that we need to um, control and orchestrate. So we have you know, our ground system uh, software and computers that we use you know, before the rocket takes off. We have our cloud data pipeline where we basically take all of the telemetry data and ingest it for, for analysis. Um, and then uh, you know, in addition to just the DAC hardware, then we also have um, a GPS simulator that needs to be orchestrated as well, and the GPS simulator uh, is hooked up to the models, and that basically sends spoof GPS signals to the vehicle to tell it, uh, to basically convince it that it's fine. Uh, and so all of this stuff needs to, um, you know, have basically be orchestrated um, so that we can automate deployments to this. Um, so some of the challenges with that, we've got multiple, multiple hardware platforms with um, varying, you know, levels of APIs. Um, some of the, you know, some of it's hardware we build, some of it's hardware we buy from, from other people. Um, you know, hardware state needs to be queried, verified, reset um, through those APIs or even sometimes like CLI tools. Um, we've got lots of software to deploy, not only into like the test system, but then also onto the, the launch system and vehicle itself. Um, and then, you know, we've got um, we've got a lot of like log and data sources that we need to be able to look at when we're um, trying to monitor the system, debug it, um, and it's time intensive. Uh, you know, time on it's an expensive system to build, um, and so uh, you know if it's not functioning properly or if we have an issue running tests, then that costs you know that costs us time and money. 
Um, so those are, those are kind of some of the challenges with operating this. I think the big one is, you know, it applies to Argo um, and how we use Argo um, is one, the, the manual, you know, the manual process that we use before Argo, which was typically, you know, a human going through a well-documented process, um, which takes a long time, is also error prone, and, um, and you know, you don't, have, um, you don't have the ability to run it unattended. Um, and then also just, you know, being able to kind of like gather all of the, when you have a human running manual steps to do things, you don't get, um, you know, you don't automatically get logging sent to centralized systems. That person would have to cut and paste logs out of that or use some tool that would do that for them. So having computers do this um, gives us lots of benefits. Um, and so we decided to, to basically orchestrate the system using uh, Argo or Argo workflows um, in particular. Um, and so why did we choose Argo workflows? Well, our, basically our entire um, tool chain and build system was already containerized. Um, so all of the software, you know, all the software that we build in-house and deploy into the launch system, all of the CLI tools, all of the API clients, you know, like everything um, is basically already built and shipped in containers when we need to get firmware onto the rocket, you know, the rocket doesn't run Docker or doesn't run Kubernetes, but, um, you know, the image lives in a Docker image, which then goes into some system, which is then capable of, of updating that. Um, and that's all done. That was all done through Docker. So it wasn't really a big leap for us to go to basically having, you know, people running tools that are containerized to then mapping it to um, a workflow system like Argo where every step is effectively, you know, is, is just a container. Um, we use Kades quite a bit as a across the company already. Um, so again, not a big, not a big jump for us. Um, and uh, we already had some experience with Argo. Um, and overall, uh, you know, it's just when looking at different options, you know, we had a um, person before us talking about like Argo workflows versus Airflow. There, there's tons of options out there for building workflows for automating things for task management and scheduling. Um, this was by far, um, out of all the options I looked at, the less, you know, the least amount of code um, to actually build the system, uh, partially because of the things, or mo maybe mostly because of the things that I already mentioned around our kind of adoption of, of Docker uh, or container images and Kubernetes. Um, and I think, you know, one other, one other aspect of that, which I don't have up here, um, which kind of relates to our, I'll get into later, our decision to use Hera, um, is that, you know, for non-embedded stuff, we do use Python quite a bit. Um, and so uh, when we decided to leverage Hera, having, having a Python tool that allowed us to basically kind of codify and create those workflows was, um, was very beneficial as well. Um, so a couple of key considerations that we were thinking about when, um, you know, when we, before we started building this, um, the, version of the Argo workflow, or at least capturing the state of an Argo workflow, you know, at a point in time uh, is important to us because the environment evolves over time. And so its configuration will change over time. And sometimes we may need to go back in time to basically run, you know, to run the same uh, test or simulation in the exact same environment that we ran it before because we need to go back to an older piece of hardware, an older piece of software. So, um, you know, we're not, you know, like, uh, you know, unlike writing a web app or something, you know, it's not always just living off of main or trunk the whole time and, you know, kind of moving forward. Sometimes you have to move back and you want to know what, um, you know, what workflow you ran with a particular test or simulation so that you can run it again later. Or later down the road, you may discover that there was, discover that there was a bug in there uh, and you want to know you know, basically which tests or simulations were impacted by that bug and the bug could actually be in the workflow that could, you know, potentially have an impact on the outcome. So you need to have all that metadata. Um, workflows, so basically we wanted to be able to trigger the hardware in the loop simulations, you know, through pipelines, um, you know, through GitLab or GitHub type pipelines where basically like if somebody is working on a particular piece of code and they make a change, uh, they want to be able to ship that change. Uh, and in addition to their unit tests and local integration tests, they want to be able to kind of run that, run it on this platform, um, which in the manual world, that was, you know, hard because then now they've got to coordinate getting time to the time to access the system. They've got to figure out how to use it and how to get their code deployed on and how to run it. Um, and so we really wanted it to be, you know, as simple as possible um, from an automation perspective. Um, it also though needs to be trigger, trigger, triggerable via humans. 
So, you know, we don't, not all of our use cases are, are just, you know, pipelines or automated processes kicking off jobs. We have humans that want to run, you know, basically one-off tests or series of tests um, and maybe potentially, you know, test out certain software configurations or certain hardware changes uh, and, then, and then go run that test, you know, through something, you know, like a GUI. Um, and we also, uh, you know, because this is an expensive resource, you know, we can't just like go to Amazon and say, you know, give me, you know, like a thousand simulation environments. And if we could, it would probably be prohibitively expensive. But so we have few of these resources um, and we generally have more demand for them than we have supply. Uh, so we need to be able to queue all of the, the requests coming into the system. Um, which, you know, which Argo doesn't natively do for us. And we also need to be able to lock those resources to ensure that, you know, we don't have multiple people or multiple systems running, um, running workflows on a simulation environment at the same time. Um, so at a high level, um, architecture overview are really technology choices. Um, no surprise there, we're talking, we're at ArgoCon, I'm talking about Argo. Uh, we chose Argo workflows, I already kind of talked about um, why that was a fairly easy choice for us. Um, for actually kind of authoring and codifying the workflows, uh, we chose Hera, which is a Python SDK um, that basically allows you to, uh, it has, you know, basically full APIs into all of the Argo workflow primitives, the stuff that you would see, you know, in the, in the CRDs or in the YAML when you're building a workflow and allows you to basically author that in Python. Uh, and so you can codify your entire workflow in Python uh, and then use and then use Hera to produce basically a uh, you know a YAML that you would then submit to your Argo workflow instance. You could you know you could actually just use it to create the YAML file and you could you know keep track of that yourself if you want. In our case, we specifically from from Hera we just run the Python code to generate the YAML and then submit it every time we run a job. I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, I don't honestly know, you know, in terms of like the Argo community, I don't know much about like complexity of workflows and what other people are doing. Like we have around 2.5 uh, thousand lines of Hera code, which um, is, I don't know if that's a lot or a little, um, but we do have like a lot of, you know, like kind of like uh, helper classes and stuff to make it easy to kind of write new workflows and to add, to add functionality to workflows. Um, and then to basically, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we need to be able to queue these jobs um, coming into Argo. And so we built basically a, a purpose specific queue for this around Fast API, which is just a, a Python web framework um, and Postgres. Uh, and, uh, and then also using some of our internal um, or existing internal web platform and Angular UI in front of it, which I'll, I'll kind of give show you some screenshots of in a little bit. Um, so next, I guess we'll kind of like just look um, at a high level kind of overview of the architecture here. So on the top left, I kind of tried to demonstrate here that we have, we have multiple inputs coming in uh, to the system. You know, we have pipelines and we have end users uh, talking, you know, or requesting uh, simulations through either UI or API. Um, those get uh, queued up into a system that we have uh, coined as HillQ, uh, kind of shortened gets the point across. And so that basically stacks up a uh, request for Argo jobs. So basically what happens is like a user comes to this system and uh, there's two main inputs. There is, uh, or actually three main inputs. There is what is the software version, you know, of the launch system that I want to test, like a, you know, a Git ref or something that um, actually links to basically like every single piece of software that goes into the system. So you can kind of think of it as a deployment manifest. Then there is what is the version of the Argo workflow uh, that I want to run, which is basically, you know, the Git ref for our Hera code base. Um, and then what is the target environment? And so you provide those three inputs and then it gets stacked up in, into this task queue. And, um, and when your target environment is available, um, then the next step is that it'll actually take, uh, we package our Hera code in, in uh, container images. So like every time you wanna update the, uh, the workflow or create a new version of it and you go and make an update to, your Hera, to our Hera code base, that produces a net new container image and that's tagged you know, along and that lines up with, you can correlate that to 
the Git ref. And so basically when you tell the system, hey, go run this workflow for me on Argo, it knows that it has to go get a particular version of our Hera Docker image. And then it actually runs that in a Kubernetes job, which then runs the Hera and then submits the YAML to Argo and then kicks off the workflow. Um, and then basically the, the Hilkey system will just uh, effectively babysit the workflows, um, you know, so it knows at all times, you know, which workflows are running on which systems. Um, and it, it also, uh, you know, it, it basically has a, we do that through like the, uh, through the Argo API, the, the web API, not, not the, not the Argo, uh, not like the CR, not the Kubernetes API and the CRDs for the actual Argo workflows, but the thing that you talk to when you're in the Argo UI, there's a REST API behind that. And so we actually just query that directly um, to get workflow status. And so whenever we put something into Argo, we have a bunch of metadata in there so we know how to track it. And that's in our, you know, in our queue database and we can, we can come back and check up on it later. Um, and uh, yeah, and so then basically Argo goes ahead and orchestrates that job against our simulation platform. Um, so let's see here, we've got about nine minutes left. I'll kind of go through a couple of things here around, you know, just user experience and what it looks like. Um, so as I'd mentioned, uh, you know, so we have the queue that basically kind of stacks all the jobs before they go into Argo. And then we have an API and UI in front of that. And so this is actually what the uh, end user would see. So if I had a, um, if I had like, you know, a pipeline that's kicked off a simulation job and I want to come and check on the status of that, I can go to this UI and I can basically see, you know, okay, this is the job that's running and it's actually got a link to the Argo uh, UI in there. So I can go see the status of that workflow. Um, I can see, you know, basically which jobs are stacked up waiting to go on to, um, waiting for Argo to execute on our simulation platforms. I can see which job is coming up next. And then also got a little bit of visibility there of the environments that are available. Um, what does the workflow look like? Well, so at a high level, it kind of looks like this. <laughs> um, or actually, you've got another version of it here too. Um, again, I don't really know, like for, for Argo, I don't know like how complicated these workflows are in terms of like logic and nodes and everything like that. Um, I think for at least my experience, you know, doing this with something other than Hera would have been would have been really tough. It was actually fairly fairly easy to do in Hera and to kind of um, keep it all in my head um, and know what's going on. Whereas, kind of just you know trying to like build our own tool to manually construct the YAML or or use something else would have been, I think, a, a little bit more challenging. Um, one other screenshot here that I've got is just kind of a little kind of. Uh, when we're actually running it, the Argo workflow, as it goes through, you know, kind of each step of the simulation process of configuring the hardware, deploying the software, um, we actually also have it shoot, um, the workflow itself shoots messages back to basically a chat channel that we have that provides uh, people that are, that have jobs running with the links um, so that they can go drill down into the workflow if, uh, you know, if a step fails or something like that, or if they need to, if they just want to go see like what the status is. Um, so, um, in terms of experiences with Argo, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I feel like we were able to build this out much faster um, because we were using Argo and because we were already kind of had everything containerized and we're very Kubernetes centric. Um, you know, the other things that Argo got us out of the box that were super helpful were, you know, basically having, um, having a system that automatically integrates with our SSO, automatically having like a log archiving system built into it. Um, we know one of the things that we struggled with before, as I mentioned, is that when people are running this and they're running these steps by hand or running the simulations by hand, you know, it's up to a human being to basically capture all of the output and get it into, you know, some system where we can see it later. Um, you know, Argo gives us all that out of the box because you know, in our workflow, we can just basically say every step, you know, for every step should be archived and then it automatically captures all the log output, keeps it in object store. And then if I wanna go look at a job that ran two months ago, I can go look at that job and then, uh, and then see all of the logs for every step in that job. Um, and uh, I'd say, I guess the only other thing is that I know that there, I don't know what the current status is, but I've heard people talking about having a, basically like a more kind of like Argo or uh, K it's native Q. I think that would, um, that would definitely be a welcome addition. Um, I feel like, you know, what we built kind of going back here uh, to um, the, the system for kind of queuing up Argo jobs. I imagine that that, you know, is not 
an uncommon use case. Um, and so I was kind of surprised that, that, um, that there hasn't really been any traction around that lately, but maybe if, uh, maybe if folks know of something they want to tell me about it, we can do that in the Q&A. Um, let's see here. What else do we got? Um, oh, Hera. Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, considering how few people raise their hands around Hera at the beginning of the talk, I would say if there's one thing um, you walk away from this with, if you're using Argo, I would definitely check out Hera. Um, I, I felt like it made implementing this project way easier. Um, you know, I would actually, I feel like I actually kind of learned the Argo workflows API through the Hera code base because I would just, when I was trying to figure out how to do stuff, I would just go read through the, you know, Hera basically maps all of the, um, all of the Argo resources into Python code so I could just kind of go jump into their code, look at it, see, you know, see how those things worked. Um, I felt like it was actually better, better than reading documentation. Um, uh, I feel like it's a lot easier to just kind of reason about complex workflows in Python um, versus YAML. And then we got a lot of benefit um, out of just creating reusable code. So like for our workflows, um, when we have, you know, we have like some baseline kind of classes and functions that set up boilerplate for common tasks, you know, for example, like uh, CPU and memory resource limits, you know, you can kind of set all that stuff up in one place for tasks that share the same container image. You can set all that stuff up in one place. Um, for our, you know, Mattermost or kind of Slack type notifications, um, you know, we just had like a little helper class for that. And then, you know, I can literally just write like, you know, take entire, the entire Argo, uh, you know, like an entire DAG and say, uh, effectively, like for everything in this DAG, you know, send a Mattermost message if, if one of them fails, that type of stuff. So I found it to be super useful. I would definitely recommend checking it out if you hadn't and if you have not. And, um, and also just developer response um, from the Hera developers was great as well. I'd open a couple bugs um, with at least one bug and then a couple feature requests um, and always got like super prompt feedback. And, um, and yeah, overall, great experience. Um, and then just as kind of a parting screenshot here, um, kind of talking about Hera, you know, this is basically kind of like how uh, our workflow initialization kind of works at the, the end of our Hera code base, um, where, you know, we basically got a couple of different DAGs, and then we set them up, and then we set some, you know, things to basically like, you know, if this, if this DAG uh, succeeds, run this thing, if this DAG fails, run that thing, uh, and then uh, and then on exit, run another DAG, which is just basically a, a list of common, you know, tasks that we run um, at the end of every workflow. Uh, and so, obviously, there's like a lot of code that goes uh, behind this to to set these things up. But in terms of kind of being able to express what you're trying to do, uh, I found it super useful. Uh, all right, we've got two minutes for questions. Anybody? Okay, thanks. <laughs>